<coughs> the order for evening prayer daily throughout the year. O Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. Dearly beloved brethren, the scripture moves us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with a humble, lowly, penitent, and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, Yet ought we most chiefly so to do when we assemble and meet together to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisite and necessary as well for the body as the soul. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you as many as are here present to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice under the throne of the heavenly grace, saying after me, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have fallen too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we've done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent according to thy promises. Declare it unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant a most merciful Father for his sake. That we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life. To the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, has given assurance that he pardons and absolves all those who truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him ever to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever amen O lord open thou our lips and our mouth shall show forth thy praise O god make speed to save us O lord make haste to help us Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Our Psalter election for the evening is Psalm 5. David, being grievously oppressed by the cruelty of his enemies and apprehending still more the mischief, earnestly beseeches God for help. And the more easily to obtain what he asks after having by the earnestness of his prayers manifested the greatness of his grief, he first brings forward the intolerable malice of his enemies showing how inconsistent it would be with the character of God were they to go unpunished. He next speaks of his own faith and patience and even comfort, having no doubt whatever of a happy issue. Finally, he concludes 
that when he shall be delivered, the benefits resulting from his deliverance would not be limited to himself, but would extend to all the godly. To the chief musician on Nehalot, a psalm of David. Some translate the Hebrew word Nehalot, heritage. Others translate it as armies. The former assign this reason for their opinion that David prayed for the welfare of the 12 tribes whom he calls heritages. The latter assert in support of their view that being besieged by a vast multitude of men, he betook himself to God for succor. According to this sense, the word upon will signify, will signify against but not approving of the conjectures of many who speak upon these inscriptions of the Psalms as if they were riddles, I adopt the opinion of those who hold that it was either a musical instrument or a tune, but of what particular kind I consider it of little importance to ascertain. Psalm 5, 1 and 2. My words do thou give ear to, O Jehovah, attend to my speech. Hearken to the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for to thee will I pray. We will resume this tomorrow. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, <clears throat> as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Chapter 3, 1 through 6, Arrangements for the Passage Through the Jordan, Joshua 3, 1 through 6. Lun passed the night, then in a wider sense, to tarry. Proverbs fifteen thirty one here means to rest. According to verse 2, they stayed there three days at the end after the extirpation of three days, cannot refer to the three days mentioned in chapter 111, if only because of the omission of the article, apart from the reasons given in the note upon chapter 111, which preclude the supposition that the two are identical. The reasons why the Israelites stayed three days by the side of Jordan after leaving Shittim are not given but they are not difficult to guess. For in the first place, before it could be possible to pass into an enemy's country, not only with an army, but with all the people, including wives, children, and all their possessions, and especially when the river had first of all to be crossed, it must have been necessary to make necessary preparations, which would easily occupy two or three days. Besides this, the Jordan at this time was so high as to overflow its banks, so that it was impossible to cross the fords, and they were obliged to wait till the obstruction was removed. But as soon as Joshua was assured that the Lord would make a way for his people, he issued the following instructions through the proper officers to all the people in the army. When ye see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, and see the Levitical priests bear it, then ye shall remove from your place, and go after it. If there shall be a space between you and it, about two thousand cubits by measure, come not near unto it, that you may know the way by which ye go. For ye have not passed this way yesterday and the day before. On the expression, the Levitical priests, see Deuteronomy 31, 25, as compared with verse 9 and Joshua 17, 9, both here and in chapter 8, 11, should probably be pointed by me, C.E. Wald. 
The command referred to to the march from the first resting place by Jordan into the river itself and not the passage through the river during which the priests maintained standing with the ark in the bed of the river until the people had all passed over. We will resume our march with Joshua tomorrow. Now we turn our attention to Matthew Henry's commentary on Revelation 1, 3 through 7. Blessed is he that readeth and hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is, which was, which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Blessed is he that cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and also they which pierced him, and all kindreds or nations of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. We have here an apostolic benediction on those who should give a due regard to this divine revelation. And this benediction is given more generally and more especially. More generally to all, either who read or hear the words of this prophecy. This blessing seems to be pronounced with a design to encourage the study of the book, and not to be worry, weary of looking into it on account of the obscurity of many things in it. It will repay the labor of the careful and attentive reader. Observe, it is a blessed privilege to receive the oracles of God. <clears throat> this was one of the principal advantages that the Jews had over the Gentiles. It is a blessed thing to study the scriptures. Those who are well employed, who search the scriptures. It is a privilege not only to read the scriptures for ourselves, but to hear them read by others. We're qualified to give us the sense that they read and lead us into an understanding of them. It is not sufficient to our blessedness that we read and hear the scriptures, but that we keep the things that are written. We must keep them in our memories, in our minds, in our affections, and in our practice. We shall be blessed in the deed. Five, the nearer we come to the accomplishment of scripture, the greater regard we shall give to them. The time is at hand, and we should be should be so much the more attentive as we see the day approaching. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior, for he hath regarded the lowliness of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath magnified me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him throughout all generations. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seat, and hath exalted the humble and meek. 
He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He, remembering his mercy, hath hope in his servant Israel, as he promised to our forefathers, Abraham and his seed forever. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. <coughs> Pick up here on the inspired nature of scripture, commenting the text of Exodus 7, 1 through 4. Exodus 4, 10 through 16, where Moses scrolls through his excuses for not wanting to talk on God's behalf. God declares that he who made the man's mouth would be Moses to teach him what to say to the people. When Moses continued to object that he was not eloquent, God declared that Moses would become like God to Pharaoh. 7 verse 1. And would utilize Aaron as his prophet, Navi. And that Aaron would speak to the people and to Pharaoh for Moses as if he were your mouth, and as if you were God to him. Accordingly, when Pharaoh refused, he was actually refusing to listen to Moses. From this material, we see that for Moses to be Moses' prophet, two conditions were essential. He could not speak for himself, and the one for whom he spoke had to be for him as God. According to these passages, then, the true prophet was the one who did not put forth his own words or speak out of his heart, rather was an appointed regular speaker for a divine superior whose speech carries the authority of the latter. In short, the prophet was God's spokesman. We will pick up with Jessica Numbers 12, 6. And now from Zwingli, Philip Schaff on Ulrich Zwingli. A couple of po a poem here. We'll just read the poems. He, was, he liked poetry and he liked music, like as did Luther. Help me, O oh Lord, in the begin is the beginning of a sickness, my strength and my rock. Lo, at the door I hear death's knock. Uplift thine arm, once pierced for me, that conquered death and set me free. And if thy voice in life's mid midday recalls my soul, then I obey. In faith and hope, earth I resign, secure of heaven, for I am thine. In the midst of his sickness, <clears throat> my pains increase, haste to console, for fear and woe siege body and soul. Death is at hand, my senses fail, my tongue is dumb, now Christ prevail. Lo, Satan strains to snatch his prey, I feel his grip, grip must I give way. He harms me not, I fear no loss, for here I lie beneath the cross, unrecovered from his sickness. My God, my Lord, healed by thy hand, upon the earth once more I stand. Let sin no more rule over me, my mouth shall sh sing alone of thee. Though now delayed, my hour will come involved perchance in deeper, deeper gloom. But let it come with joy I'll rise and bear my yoke straight to the skies. Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation which thou hast prepared before the face of all enemies, to be a light to lighten the Gentiles, to be the glory of thy people Israel. 
Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Question 31, what is effectual calling? Effectual calling is the work of God's Spirit whereby convincing us of our sin and misery, enlightening our minds in the knowledge of Christ, and renewing our wills. He doth persuade and enable us to embrace Jesus Christ freely presented to us in the gospel. 32. What benefits do they that are effectually called partake of in this life? They that are effectually called do in this life partake of justification, adoption, sanctification, as well as the several benefits which either accompany or flow from them. 33. What is justification? Justification is an act of God's free grace when he pardons all our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight, only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. 34. What is adoption? Adoption is an act of God's free grace, whereby we are received into the number and have a right to all the privileges of the sons of God. 35. What is sanctification? Sanctification is the work of God's free grace, whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and are enabled more and more to live unto righteousness and more and more to die unto sin. 36. What are the benefits which in this life do accompany or flow from justification, adoption, and sanctification? The benefits which in this life do accompany or flow from justification, adoption, and sanctification are these. The assurance of God's love, peace of conscience, joy in the Holy Ghost, increase of grace, and perseverance therein to the end. 37. What do believers receive at death? The souls of believers are at death, made perfect in holiness, and do immediately pass into glory, their bodies being still united to Christ, who rest in the grave until the resurrection. 38. What benefits do believers receive from Christ at the resurrection? At the resurrection, believers being raised up in glory shall be openly acknowledged and acquitted in the day of judgment and made perfectly blessed for the full, to the full enjoying of God to all eternity. 39. What is the duty that God requires of man? The duty which God requires of man is obedience to his revealed will. 40. What did God at first reveal to man for the rule of his obedience? The rule which God at first revealed to man for his obedience was the moral law. The Lord be with you and with thy spirit, let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us and grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save them that rule and mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. And do thy ministers with righteousness, make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people and bless thine inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, because there is none other that fighteth for us, but only thou, O God. 
O God, may clean our hearts within us and take not thy Holy Spirit from us. Lord, we beseech thee, grant thy people grace to withstand the temptations of the world, of the flesh, and the devil, and with pure hearts and minds to follow thee through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that both our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lighten our darkness, O Lord, we beseech thee, and by thy great mercy. Defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of thy only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Almighty Father, whose kingdom is everlasting, we beseech thee of thy mercy to direct and prosper the counsels of all those who bear authority in this land, that in humility and honesty they may faithfully serve the people committed to their charge. And grant, we pray thee, that religion and piety, peace and unity, truth and justice may be established amongst us for all generations. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, who alone worketh great marvels, send down upon our bishops and pastors and all congregations committed to their charge the healthful spirit of thy grace, and that they may truly please thee, pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. <coughs> Grant this, O Lord, for the honor of our advocate and mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time, with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and us promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, I will grant the requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost, rest and abide upon us now and forevermore. Amen. Here ends the order for evening prayer daily. Right here.